Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the American Society of Pain and Neurosciences Rising Leaders in Pain and Neuroscience webinar. This is focusing on perspectives from the next generation of leaders in the field. We are so appreciative that you've all joined us this evening. I would like to now introduce our two moderators, Dr. Timothy Deer and Dr. Dalwood Sayed. Drs. Deer and Sayed, please take it away. Good evening, everybody. We're uh, again very uh, thrilled. I'm actually very excited about tonight's program uh, where we're going to see uh, some perspectives from a lot of leaders in our field that sometimes don't get the opportunity uh, to be heard. So we thought it was very important, especially for uh, Aspen being kind of a, a young society uh, itself, is that we give you know adequate voice to our new leaders, uh, our established leaders as well. Um, some of the people that you'll be hearing today have been around for several years as well, so I don't want to uh, shortchange you know, their accomplishments, but we do feel like they're kind of the future minds of our field. Tim? Well, Dalwood, you know, I think uh, over the last decade, one of my goals has been to find talented young people and help them build their careers. And uh, certainly tonight is a great opportunity for us to see some of that talent in our area of medicine. I think it's one of the most talented fields of medicine right now. And the good news is there's much to be done, much research, much development, much teaching. And we're going to hear from both uh, our rising leaders, but also several of our guest moderators who've become leaders in, in their own right over the last five years or so. And I think that'll be a very exciting. And I want to talk a little bit about how they can get involved. And I'll have you start by talking about our committee structure. Yeah, absolutely. We're really excited to uh, now finally that uh, the society has been uh, a little bit more robust and a lot more organization and administrative support to be able to launch uh, our various committees. You know, we took in uh, surveys and feedback from all of the, you know, over, I want to say 4,000 members at this point in our society officially um, about what kind of committees that had the most interest. And these were the ones that uh, that our membership seemed to have the most interest in. So if you can kind of see this slide here, these are going to be our first initial uh, uh, committees that we'll be launching. Uh, if you uh, have any interest, and especially everyone on the call tonight, uh, please do uh, reach out uh, to the uh, email address and uh, mention uh, which societies or correction, which committees you'd like to be involved in, and, and we'll get you involved. And just to, just to highlight a few of those, you know, I think our international committee is getting off to a great start with Rita Tolba. So if you're an international person tonight, I know we have probably close to a thousand people on tonight with us. Uh, if you're international, please reach out. We're building that that community. If uh, we have a great diversity and inclusion committee, remember Jackie Weisman, and if you have an interest there, Armed Forces Committee. We had a young man uh, uh, approach us today who wants to be a member of our of our future leaders, and uh, he's in the military in San Diego. So I, I think there's a lot of opportunity. We're going to play this. Uh, are we going to play? I'm not sure we're going to play the video or not. Um, do we have Erica's video uh, to play, um, Michelle? If not, I'll just talk a little bit about the program. Here we go. Hi everyone. Erica Peterson here. I'm really excited to announce that we are ready to launch the Poster to Podium program as part of our ASPN mentorship initiatives. The goal of the Poster to Podium program is to develop several different categories of leaders, leaders in research, leaders in innovation and partnering with industry, and leaders in national societies that are focused on pain and neurosciences. This is an application process. It is competitive, and we are excited to promote forward young career clinicians, early career investigators, and those who are looking for better exposure and opportunities to launch a career involved in these areas. Areas. There are full details on the ASPN website and a, a web-based application to participate in the program is there as well. You may have heard me talk about this before. There's been write-ups about it in our ASPN newsletters when we talked about the mentoring program, as well as a few presentations that we've done over the course of the webinars for the past four a year or so. But now is the chance, finally, with the loosening of some of the CDC COVID restrictions, we feel like we can launch the first class to begin at our annual meeting at ASPN in Miami in July. And the full 12 month program will go through a program of various lectures and other experiences, which are geared towards leadership development, speaking skill development, presentation development, as well as the, the taking you from a research 
project at a poster level to a podium presentation at the ASPN annual meeting in 2022. If you have questions, I hope you'll reach out to me, to Dr. Syed or to Dr. Deer. Take a look at the reference information on the website and please get your applications in by early June. We'll be able to review them all and identify our first class of participants in time for our launch at the meeting in July. Look forward to hearing from you and thank you so much for your interest. So, yeah, Dr. Erica Peterson is, uh, I think, a true a role model for many, and she certainly is uh, someone who, this was her idea, the poster to podium, and her idea was to help build young leaders. So if you want to be on that podium uh, presenting major research and impact in the field, this is a program for you, and Erica will lead that along with folks like Al Absaad, Dr. Jason Pope, and others who will help select those people. So I encourage you to, to enter that. So we'll go to our first panel, and um, Dalwood will be joining me back here um, and I think, uh, Dawood, our goal here is to discuss education and training, which I think will be very important, uh, obviously, to create that group of leaders. I'd ask everyone to turn their cameras on on the first panel. We have an amazing panel, which I'll, 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 Dawood, I'll give over to you to introduce our guest moderator, uh, who's a leader in education, one of my favorite uh, educators in the world, at Johns Hopkins. And I'll let you introduce her, and then we'll have the panel uh, then be asked some questions. So back to Dawood. Oh, thank you, Tim. I think... Uh... Shravani has been a great friend. She's essentially become so famous, you know, with her pain rounds that she's simply referred to as Dr. D across the country. I saw really the exciting announcement that, you know, pain rounds and her work is going to be featured on the Lancet Journal. So that's, you know, just a tremendous thing for our field. So Dr. D, please take it from here. Thanks, guys. I'm so honored to be here. And Tim and Dawood, you guys have been so instrumental, really, in building my career. And I can't thank you enough for all the support. And um, Dr. D really wouldn't exist without all of you guys. So thank you for that. Um, and with that, we'll get started. So we have an awesome panel of up and coming leaders here. Um, and some that I would say are, are actually not even up and coming. They are leaders. And so I'm really excited to help moderate this panel. So we're going to start with Dr. Preet Patel. Preet, what kind of promising innovations have you seen in pain medicine? Thank you for the question, Dr. D. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. My name is Preet Patel, and I'm a PGY5 pain medicine fellow at Rutgers in New Jersey. Um, so coming up on graduation, as I look back over the past years, I'm, I'm so impressed and immensely grateful for all the opportunities and innovations with respect to my education that I've been afforded. Um, Dr. Syed already touched on one of them. Johns Hopkins has created an online neuromodulation curriculum for any fellows who may not have access to these advanced therapies in their training. Um, so there are pre-tests and post-tests post and there are videos with uh, internationally recognized faculty where they walk you through the nuances of neuromodulation. So you know, if you're feeling a little bit um, underwhelmed with your neuromodulation training, it's a great resource. In addition, if you had told me at the start of the pandemic that during my training, I would be sitting on my couch and getting trained on the weekends through virtual reality, I would have said, you know, that sounds like something out of science fiction. But the MedEd Combine has uh, afforded so many of us the opportunity to, with the set of virtual, with the, the use of virtual reality, to be able to see new technologies um, that are on the forefront of what we do and kind of get an, a taste of, of what these therapies are and how they can help our patients. Um, and as we come out of the pandemic now, we're seeing a return of in-person meetings. And so cadaver course trainings are uh, vital. Um, throughout the course of my career, I expect that there will be an influx of new technology um, and new therapies that will help my patients in the community. And I think that these cadaver course trainings really give us the hands-on experience that, we're need, that we need in order to be able to consider whether these therapies are right for our patients. So the Pacific Spine and Pain Society recently put on two cadaver courses, which were wonderful. I know we have a few coming up this summer and I encourage everyone to be able to take advantage of these. So um, it's really just been a remarkable year and I'm very grateful for all of the initiatives that so many people like Dr. D have taken in order to help advance all of our training. Awesome, thank you. That was a great answer. Um, Anthony, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that? Well, I think it's great. He's talking about a lot of the silver linings of the pandemic. You know, the webinar right here in itself, we have 40 of the new, 40, 45, 50 of the new leaders that are all educating each other and educating the world of Aspen um, about everything we know about this great field. 
And I think he touched on two great things that have come out with the pain rounds and with the med ed combine. I, I myself host with the med ed combine. I know you host the pain rounds and we're even talking about somehow coming together in order to teach fellows, teach residents, get this new stuff into people's hands so much easier while you're on your couch. You know, you can do it on, on your laptop or through VR. It's very interesting, very cool where we're going and very exciting. That's fantastic. Uh, thank you both for that insight. So um, I want to ask the next questions to uh, Dr. Nashi and Dr. Benheim. Um, so Dr. Nashi, uh, currently, you know, when we talk about pain education, where do you think the deficiencies are? And then I'll ask Dr. Benheim the same question. I know, I understand she's a neurosurgeon. So uh, the deficiencies in pain med medic medicine education. Yeah, um, I, I, um, I am from Cincinnati. I'm the program director at TriHealth. Um, I've been practicing for eight years and um, coming out of fellowship, um, I think we do a really good job at um, training on interventions and procedures and medication management. But I think an opportunity for um, improvement would be kind of educating uh, on the business of medicine, the CPT coding, the um, billing, what insurances cover, what types of procedures and kind of how do we um, you know, out of the gates of fellowship, how do we thrive and hit kind of um, hit the ground running and not have such a exponential growth curve as far as um, figuring out uh, the the business side of medicine, which which we aren't really taught uh, much in fellowship. That's wonderful, Dr. Benheim. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Sharona Benheim. I am a functional neurosurgeon at UC San Diego. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, so, you know, as far as opportunities for uh, our deficiencies that are currently in our training, you know, I have a completely different perspective um, on the neurosurgical side of things. I think we're relatively well trained in the basics of pain neurosurgery. So things like uh, stimulation, spinal cord stimulation, and intrathecal pumps and so forth. But there's really a wide range of procedures that are essentially no longer being taught and are, are ultimately on the verge of becoming extinct, um, particularly those ablative procedures you know, that are commonly used in end-of-life cancer-related pain, things like percutaneous chordotomy, midline myelotomy, um, trigeminal nucleotomies, tractotomies, and so on. You know, these are really can be very highly effective procedures. Um, and uh, from a training perspective, uh, we need to make a really a concerted effort to bring these procedures back into the armamentarium of neurosurgeons and also make others, you know, including oncologists, palliative care doctors, just aware of their existence. Great, thank you for that. Shravani? Awesome, yeah, uh, great answers, guys. The next question I have is, do you think there's an, there's value to having an additional year, uh, year for advanced interventions? And I'm gonna go ahead and give this uh, question to Dr. Varsh. Yes, and I, I think one of the key things is just awareness of what those careers are like and, and how that proceeds. It's, it's one thing to you know, go through your fellowship and, and, and get that understanding of what a clinical practice is like. But when you're going through and wanting to see what the other options are like with research and with policy and with the industry options, I think there's so much that that needs to be shown to a lot of trainees as they're going through the careers. And I think just the opportunities to see what those careers are like is one of the main things. There's a lot of informal or formal programs that can exist to make sure that trainees are getting that exposure. And I think uh, just having some programs available through things like the National Institute of Health or through uh, other um, uh, industry sponsored uh, programs, I think that's one of the main things that would be great for fellows to get a chance to see. That's fantastic. Uh, I have a question for um, Dr. Pawar um, in regards to, you know, when, I guess, no offense, Tim, when Tim was doing his pain fellowship, primarily most of the people that went into pain fellowships were from anesthesiology. You fast forward now, uh, it's a lot more of a diverse field, still uh, primarily anesthesiology and physiatry, but now we have people from various backgrounds, surgical backgrounds, emergency medicine, um, psychiatry, neurology, and amongst some others. How do we factor that in when we're developing a pain medicine fellowship curriculum with all of this variation in uh, core specialties? 
Thank you so much for that great question. I'm Dr. Pavar. I'm PGY6 at University of Rochester, New York. So my background is psychiatry and I've done an addiction fellowship. So I felt during my fellowship, the most important thing was orientation by the program director, setting up the expectations from the, pro from the fellows of non-conventional background, uh, exposing them to guest lectures from various fields, exposing them to different topics, cadaver labs, simulation labs, and also it doesn't have to be 30 minute PowerPoint presentation. It could just be a 15 minute snippet where we talk about, for example, I was psychiatry. I was I took one week out of the four weeks and talk, talked about CBT, DBT to the anesthesia and neurology uh, or PMNR residents. Similarly, anesthesia taught, anesthesia fellow talked about pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, uh, and the PMNR taught about uh, physical exams. So these things where everybody works together along with setting up expectations and not uh, the non, for example, with psychiatry, starting them on an easier procedure like SI joints, knee joint injections, and then gradually taking them to higher level procedures like spinal cord stimulation or mild procedures. So I, so I think if we, this multimodal approach, uh, helps the non-conventional fellows uh, come to uh, power with other uh, fellows also at the same time. Thank you so much for yeah, that. Yeah, great. Sorry, yeah, um, agree. Great response. I think that sort of that multidisciplinary uh, element is so important in our field, and we're, we're really happy to have residents and fellows who have different perspectives. And with that, I'm going to ask Dr. Adam Ruff, who is a PGY1 um, resident, in PMNR at Kansas, do you think pain should really be its own residency because of all this kind of multidisciplinary influence? <laughs> yes, thanks, Dr. D. Uh, in short, I think absolutely. I mean, kind of like everyone else was saying, along with the advancements in technology, the procedures, the surgical techniques, a huge influx in uh, interest in chronic pain fellowships, I think there's absolutely room for a chronic pain residency. Obviously, it's hard with the political, financial, uh, and legal barriers to getting a residency set up, but I think this is something that definitely should be, you know, looked into and maybe pushed forward in the future. Uh, maybe starting like transitioning with something such as dividing the fellowship into interventional and non-interventional uh, pathways, just, just as an example. But um, overall, I think absolutely, definitely, there should be a uh, chronic pain residency. I think it would really benefit the field. That's great, thank you so much. So, you know, we have, obviously we're challenged and you always tell the fellows like, it's always very uh, intimidating to sometimes teach a, almost a complete medical specialty in 12 months. Uh, add on to that, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, people have different aspirations in their career, whether it be policy, research, industry relations. So I was gonna ask this question to Vishal, you know, what, what can we do to better kind of, you know, we have to teach you so much in just uh, oftentimes just 12 months. What can we do to kind of help with, you know, physicians that may have other career aspirations uh, such as that I just mentioned? Right, right. No, it's a, it's a great question. And I think, sorry, I didn't get a chance to introduce myself. I'm Vishal Varshney. I'm a uh, pain physician in Vancouver, BC, Canada. And uh, just an invitation to come up to the Great White North if any of you get a chance. But uh, in terms of the opportunities, there's so much within pain medicine. And, and I think just seeing what a career in research exclusively is like, we've got some physicians doing some amazing work in, in research and that have started companies, become entrepreneurial that way. We've got some amazing pain physicians that are involved in policy and that are drafting guidelines at a national and governmental level for, for, for us to, to practice on that are evidence-based. And then within industry, we've got physicians that are making a lot of headway in terms of advancing the field and introducing new innovations. And we just need a chance to meet these physicians to find about what their career path was like and, and how they got to be where they are. And in terms of the uh, opportunities with education, and further training, things that they did, I think mentorship programs are so instrumental in, in doing that. And these would be people that uh, would be, I think, fantastic mentors to learn from and work with uh, as you develop an interest in those non-clinical aspects of a, uh, of a pain medicine career. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, so important. And we really do have a lot of great mentors that have 
pursued other careers in this field. Manola Singh, um, David Carraway, and um, so I'm going to move on to a really important question here, and I want everyone to kind of chip in on this one. Uh, we have evidence of racial, cultural, and gender-based biases in pain treatment. So how can we better integrate cultural sensitivity training in pain medicine? I know Aspen does a great job of this with the diversity and inclusion um, initiatives, but um, what do you guys think? And we'll start with Dr. Sarah Nashi, but I'd love everyone to really chip in on this one. Yeah, thanks, Dr. D. This is a great question, and I'm actually on the committee at TriHealth um, for diversity. Um, I think it starts, uh, if we can start some training and education in medical school, and just um, recognizing that, you know, racial and gender, uh, cultural, you know, discrepancy and discrimination still exists today. Um, when you come to, in terms of, you know, patient-physician relationships, I think, you know, knowing the culture, knowing um, what that culture's uh, acceptances of pain. Some cultures, um, it's okay to show pain. Others, it's kind of shameful to show pain. So knowing, meeting that patient where they are with um, where they are culturally and developing trust, um, gaining a patient's trust um, breaks down some of those barriers. And then you have the dynamics of, you know, um, gender, you know, pain medicine is still very much a, a, a male-driven or male-dominant workforce. And so there's that um, aspect of um, discrimination or those challenges there as being a female navigating in the field um, as well as the racial um, avenues. So um, making sure you dress everybody as doctor. I know you and I were talking about, you know, calling women by first names and males by doctor, um, dear, or doctor, so-and-so, you know, last name. So um, just educating uh, patients, educating colleagues, um, mutual respect across the board, I think. Um, but starting in med school um, and addressing it, I think is a good a good first step. Great. Yeah, I think what you said that I thought was key was really building that into medical school. So everybody gets that training from the ground up, whether it's unconscious bias training or getting it through industry or through societies. It really doesn't matter how it gets there. It just has to get there. Um, yeah. And um, I will say that I know that, you know, this society is super pro-female, pro-woman. We have women on every panel. And I just love that. And thanks to Dr. Deer and Dr. Syed for all of that kind of um, equality and equity. Uh, yes. initiatives. And with that, um, I just want to open it up for any final comments uh, on this panel. Yeah, I'll just say that, uh, you know, there's a lot to learn in pain medicine and uh, there can be, I think, a lot of pressure or a lot of, um, you know, this, this desire to want to learn as much as you can and almost everything within that, that time that you have in fellowship. It's a journey, not a, it's a journey. It's not a, with an endpoint. You've got a long way to go ahead and it's always important to keep learning uh, as we as we go through our careers. And certainly Dr. D, you've made a lot of opportunities exist for physicians within their career to keep learning and adding to that knowledge. And so that's one of the key things is not to feel this this compulsion to, to stuff it all into that time that you have. Giovanni, let me uh, let me make a final point on this committee, uh, you know, on this panel. Uh, you and Dawa did a great job. Um, I do think that you guys made some great points, and I, I think, you know, Anthony said something that uh, was echoed, and that is, and, and pre I think Preach started with this, you know, we learned to train differently during this pandemic. And Dr. D's work and, you know, virtual reality, I filmed a virtual reality implant that, you know, several fellows are going to have access to soon. I think really the pandemic really helped us in our educational skills in a lot of ways. Hopefully we can take those forward and improve on those. But I really think that all the things you guys said tonight was very uh, right on right on spot. I'd like, 25 years ago, Michael Stanton Hicks told me he thought we should have a pain residency. He said it will never happen because of politics. So Adam Rupp said that we should have a pain residency. Adam, Michael Stanton Hicks agree with you. And he was uh, he was pretty powerful in the field. So uh, I think that would be wonderful. And uh, from our neurosurgical and our psychiatry and our um, physiatry and anesthesia colleagues, I think the diversity of this group has been great. So uh, thank you all for the panel number one. I think it was a great success. Wish we had it all night for this, but uh, we're going to panel two. All right, thank you, Tim, for the opportunity. And that's from Excellent. all of our panel. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would, uh, we'll go into panel two. Um, spinal cord simulation, when I put my first implant in in 1993 at UVA, we had four contacts, we could turn two on, 
uh, and they were uh, plus negative or negative plus. So I think uh, yourself and uh, Scott Fritzloff from uh, our California will lead a discussion about what's going on today in today's modern world. So over to Dalvin. Yeah, I think probably no other, um, I guess, category in our field usually gets the, the younger generation excited about pain medicine more than spinal cord stimulation. I think it was one of the reasons that drew me to the field. Um, so I think it's a, it's a great topic. Uh, so Dr. Pritzloff, uh, care to kick off this session for us? Absolutely. Thank you, Dawood. Uh, just a couple of things. I just want to thank all the leadership at Aspen for really, you know, from a program director standpoint here at UC Davis, being a beacon during COVID for those hungry, I call them the young Jedis, you know, those hungry minds looking for, for knowledge and learning in a time where things were sparse. So um, Aspen has really been a leader in doing that. Um, a couple of things. This first question is going to be for, for Jay, and Jay obviously has carved a very successful neuromodulation practice um, and has been quite experienced. And, and once Jay answers, I'm actually going to have Ryan, who, um, you know, as a graduating fellow, also chime in. But one thing I can say this time of year is all of our fellows are getting ready to graduate, to kind of go out into the world and having a good SCS foundation is really important for success. Having good mentors is, is critically important. But I guess what I would ask Jay is, is there something that you wish you had known as a graduating fellow that you know now about how to integrate SCS in your practice and be successful at it uh, coming out of the gate? It's a great question. And um, first of all, Jay Shaw, I'm a pain physician in central northern New Jersey. Tim, Dawood, thank you for having me here. Great to see both of you. Um, you know, I think coming out of fellowship nowadays, if I was to give somebody advice who is coming out at this time, it really would be balance. You know, you, you really have to find the balance between practicing evidence-based medicine with so many new options coming, you know, coming at you um, with so many differing uh, indications, knowing how to choose the appropriate indication and the appropriate uh, therapy for each individual patient with pain while still maintaining and practicing safe neuromodulation practice with good surgical skill, uh, I think is, 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 is paramount. Um, I, I also think that you know, with, with uh, the, the, evolu the evolution of the evidence base of neuromodulation as well as the technology, uh, not just in neuromodulation, but also in the minimally invasive space, finding that balance where you know, coming out of fellowship, everyone is very eager to you know, provide advanced therapies for, for their patients, but to take your time, make sure that you are uh, practicing good evidence-based uh, high level of standard and efficacy practices in your in your in your practice setting whatever that may be and also realizing that you know compared to you know five or ten years ago even we now are at a time where you know there's a lot of indications that we may not you may not necessarily jump in that algorithm and you know suggest neuromodulation such as you know spinal stenosis with direct or indirect decompression, or even sacroiliac joint with stabilization or fusion. You you know to to know what options are available to you and implementing neuromodulation at the appropriate time for for that particular patient, I think is 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 very important. So so to Ryan, you know you heard some of the things that Dr. Shaw was saying. I mean, what are your you know what's your concern? You know, going out into the world and looking perhaps to start SCS? I mean, is, is he hitting on some of those fears, some of those concerns? Yeah, thank you. For, thank you so much for having me again. I'm Ryan. I'm a, a pain fellow at Mayo Clinic, almost one month done and very, uh, very short to, to starting practice here. Um, I definitely like to echo um, Dr. Shah's comments there on, um, you know, choosing the right patient for the right thing and, you know, being very selective in what you do. Um, it, you know, I, th I would say when I first started fellowship, I was kind of offering SCS and stimulation to pretty much everybody. Um, and I've kind of become more and more selective as, as the months have gone by in fellowship. Um, and also another point that I try to establish with a lot of my patients is establish expectations. Um, you know, if they're expecting to be cured from their disease, you know, or expecting 100% pain relief from a lot of these um, you know, from the SCS procedures that we have to offer, um, I would try to clarify that obviously and, and choosing the patients who have obviously the right expectation for the right uh, disease process. So, um, you know, I, I think it's great that we have all these waveforms, you know, could always salvage different types of um, uh, pain manifestations, but I think choosing the right patient for the right uh, right uh, procedure, I think is very important. So again, I'd like to echo those, those thoughts with, uh, that Dr. Shah just mentioned. 
Um, you know, one of the other things, and you know, I, I know Dawood as well has a, a, a question, but uh, just to kind of pigtail on what was being said earlier, just about waveforms and indications. I mean, it's undoubtedly we're in a renaissance right now with SCS, both with development options that are available for patients. And so just for Kunj and, and Jack also, once again, um, experienced neuromodulators as, as you've kind of gone out of the gate um, from fellowship into, into early practice. Um, how do you decide, you know, with all these waveforms, all these options now, how you're going to integrate these in your practice? And maybe maybe Kunj, you start first. Sure, sure. Thanks, Dr. Fritzloff. Um, so I'm Kunj Patel. Um, I graduated from fellowship from Brigham one point uh, about a year and a half, and I'm in private practice in St. Louis, private solo practice. Um, yeah, and it was a crazy time to open uh, private practice, and it was in the middle of the pandemic where we were evaluating patients by telemedicine, and I'd meet them for the first time at the procedure. So. Uh, you, you know, it's really tricky. You never know how they're going to respond to a needle, how they're going to uh, behave on the table. And so uh, just to echo what uh, Jay and Ryan said, you, you know, I think um, going based on the patient's presentation, you know, it's always good to start with an injection, uh, like a lumbar sympathetic block for complex regional pain syndrome. It really gets you to know the patient. Uh, I had one instance where I met the patient for the first time and very antsy with needles. So uh, in the basic injection, he almost uh, you, you know, kicked me, and so the next one was done under sedation. And, and you know, these are these are things I didn't think about as a fellow, but uh, making that transition from virtual to um, the, the full implant. And as far as choosing the right modality, you know, it's just complete. You know, it's based on the patient's pain, and you know, if they have bilateral symmetric pain, complex regional pain syndrome, I, I tend to migrate more towards a conventional spinal cord stimulation. If it's more focal, I, I tend to do DRG. Um, and, you know, PNS, again, in these situations where I'm still getting to know the patient, the interaction is not quite the same as it is uh, doing 100% in-person, which, you know, my practice is still not 100% in-person. Uh, you know, uh, choosing uh, the, the, the least aggressive options, but they can still give the patient the benefit, I think, is, is fantastic. So. Great. And hey, guys. Can you get any comment as well? Yeah, so Jack Deep, uh, Lake Havasu City. I also opened up uh, my practice in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, so it's been open for a year now or so. Um, in, in regards to waveforms, um, it's you, you really have to look at the science, the data, make sure you read every article out there, um, attend meetings and workshops, understand the technology, look at you know how transparent the companies are with the parameters and the settings. Um, so I just go out there and learn as much as possible. It's all about learning, and definitely match you. Uh, try to match your uh, the technology with the the patient, the condition. Um, it, it does a patient like a paresthesia, paresthesia free setting versus you know sub uh, sorry uh, versus paresthesia. So you want to match uh, the the technology, uh, the wave waveform, what what you understand of it with the uh, the patient condition. That's, these are great insights. I, I wanted to get, kind of interject and ask a question to Tyler. Uh, we've, you know, when Tim kind of started off talking about the first system he implanted, it, it, we've come so far. Uh, what would you like to see? Where, where do you think the biggest areas for improvement are in spinal cord stimulation? Hey, uh, thank you, Dawood, for the question. So Tyler Tachik here. I'm uh, practicing in Rapid City, beautiful Black Hills of South Dakota. Um, and, and in terms of your question, um, what really excites me about the future of spinal cord stim is all of the evidence and all of the studies coming out. So really excited to see what comes of uh, level one evidence, what comes out of diabetic studies, what comes out of uh, neck and arm studies. I know um, a lot of us struggle every day talking to insurance companies, trying to convince them that this is the right thing for our patients, trying to match the appropriate therapy to what pain state they have. And these studies really um, support what we do. They're really um, amazing options for our patients, trying to, to you know, limit opiates and also to improve quality of life. So uh, I'm a big quality guy and I track all of my outcomes longitudinally. And I think that to prove that you can mirror the studies that are coming out using the same metrics, uh, it's very exciting to me. Yeah, that's, that's uh... 
That's great, Tyler. Um, Dawa, did you? I, I had a, another quick one. I know we're running out of time, but uh, uh, did you have any other questions, Dawa, or did you want me to fire away? Go for it, Scott. Yeah. So, um, you know, obviously the indications are growing, and we we all know that. And even uh, you know, with the new term, by the way, of persistent spine pain syndrome that we're now we're we're now using. Um, I mean, the indications are growing even with things like peripheral neuropathy. And so I, I know this is hard, but I want to go around everyone. One sentence, what you think the most exciting thing you're hoping for in the next five years with, re with regard to SCS. And so maybe we start back at Jay at the top and we'll just head on back down. Sorry there. Uh, so yeah, there's so many so many different things that um, you know we could hope for as like a wish list for what we'd want for our patients in terms of safety and efficacy profile. Um, I would say uh, just making making the actual hardware of the technology um, more streamlined, and that's kind of what we're seeing across the space in general. So I'll start there and leave some other stuff for the other guys. But I would say I would love to see um, procedurally and from a technical standpoint. Uh, us getting less invasive with a higher level of efficacy, um, even things with uh, respect to lead anchoring and battery size, rechargeability, battery life. I would love to see those things um, become more and more streamlined, less invasive with a higher level of safety and efficacy for our patients with better long-term outcomes. Kuhn, how about you? Sure. Yeah. So I, I think that we haven't finished uh, innovating on the so on the software side of things. You know, with DTM just coming out recently. I mean, I I think we just scratched the surface of that. But the thing that really excites me is the ability to remotely program patients and to remotely monitor them uh, with SCS. You know, and several companies are coming out with that now. Some of some of them have announced that uh, where you can do it right from your phone, and some some of them are in the production stages. But uh, that's not even within five years, that's within the next few months. And I think that will be a big thing, especially as our field has become so um, so virtual. So I think that's one of the most exciting things for me. And the ability, as, as, um, as one of the other panelists mentioned, is to remotely monitor uh, some of the functional outcomes. If, if that can be integrated at some point, that would just be game changing for our field. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna hold to... you, I'm gonna hold you to one sentence, you know, just sure. to finish up. Uh, Ryan, how about you? Oh. Uh, you guys both stole my uh, stole my ideas there, but uh, I, I was gonna say, you know, I, I still think we have uh, more to go on waveforms. I, I, every time I think that we're done with waveforms, I always learn about a new one. DTM, you know, most recently burst DR, HF10. I heard that there's probably HF25 and HF50 coming out. Um, I'm very excited. I think each of these waveforms have a unique. Uh, a unique mechanism of action and could use be salvage. That's my long sentence. Jack. I'm most excited about uh, closed loop th uh, therapy, so I'm looking forward to the commercialization for, uh, for Saluda. So hopefully one day all the companies can have hopefully a combination therapy of closed loop and uh, what, what they have now. And Tyler. So I'm way different than what you guys are saying. So I'm really excited about social media, direct uh, education of patients, direct education of referral base. There are so many patients that we don't even know about who would really benefit from the therapies that, you know, have really good proven evidence and, and really education of, of all the patients and all the providers that refer to us. I think we're, we're just out of time there. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for uh, getting that all in. Scott, I just want to add a comment to that panel. Uh, First of all, Ryan, that, that sport coat collar is awesome. It's really popping. I like that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think Tyler's comment about social media is so spot on. And, and I, I know a lot of things going on in the field that I can't talk about that is being developed. So I think we're really in the beginning of way important development. I think what you've seen so far is you're, we're in the first inning of a nine inning game. It's going to be really exciting for all of you. And, uh, but I do think we have to get more outreach to patients. So I loved that last answer and I loved all your answers. So Scott, good job leading the panel. I think you did a wonderful job. So what our next panel, uh, we'll move good forward. Job, Only based on spine procedures. Uh, you know, I, I started doing the mild procedure about 10 years ago. 
we did the early vertiflex procedures and we've seen a real evolution so uh, we've got dr jessica jameson to help us lead this uh, discussion dalwood back to you yeah this is kind of a the another part of pain management and pain medicine i think that is really evolving i think your analogy that we're in the first inning of the uh, of a nine inning game definitely applies here i think we're going to really see a lot of innovation in this uh, area of minimally invasive spine one of those pioneers uh, in that charge is Dr. Jessica Jamison. So I'm going to let her uh, take charge of this panel. Okay, thank you very much for having me. I agree that this is a pretty exciting uh, area of our field. And I think we'll probably kind of overlap a little bit with some of the educational pieces and the training pieces and then what the future holds here. Dr. Engel, let's start with you. Uh, as we start to expand the pain physician capabilities as it relates to some of these kind of minimally invasive spine procedures, talk to me a little bit about your thoughts regarding the best way to do this um, as it relates to the evidence for each and every one of these procedures. Yes, thank you for having me and thank you for your question. I'm Allison and I'm first year at a fellowship. I'm at the Spine and Nerve Centers of the Virginias. So I would say formal education is a big, a big component of this. Um, repeated hands-on training at cadaver labs, such as ASPN and NANS, um, and collaboration as well. Excellent, thank you. <clears throat> With our, um, I'm sorry, was I muted? Oh, Neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons. You were muted, yeah, we got, <laughs> there we go, keep going. <laughs> yeah, formal education, um, going back to that following guides such as those published by the ASPN Working Group, learning from modules such as um, Dr. D's pain rounds is really important. And then considering pain medicine residency, as uh, Dr. Dyad sa stated earlier, those are really important components to gain our core surgical competency and then also knowing our evidence-based medicine training. So um, I think it's also important to inc incorporate some of these practices into medical education uh, at, in, in medical school in addition to residency and fellowship. Wonderful. Dr. Kerpikar, talk to us a little bit about the training that we receive for these sort of things in fellowship. Is this a reasonable thing to expect that we can incorporate all these new kind of min minimally invasive spine procedures into fellowship? And if the answer is no, then what really is uh, the ideal way to train physicians in your opinion? So hi, I'm Mira Kerpikar. Um, I've been attending at NYU Langone for the past three years. Um, so I'm actually going to deviate a little bit and broaden the topic just so I can offer my perspective. So uh, my main focus, my, my niche, if you will, at NYU is pelvic pain. So it's often, you know, undertreated, poorly understood, and it's not something that I really trained in during fellowship. So in addition to think procedures like mild vertiflex, pelvic pain procedures such as pudendal nerve blocks, pudendal radiofrequency ablation, which are things that I do very often in my practice, and um, not that many people that I know, at least in New York, um, do this in an academic setting that often. It's not often part of like a core curriculum. Um, and so this is something that I sort of learned on my own, um, uh, taught myself a lot, and trial and error to kind of get it going and to um, be able to offer those patients help. And so with that, you know, I try to um, pass that along to my fellows and residents so that they'll be able to expand their own practices in the future and be able to incorporate these therapies. And so, you know, in terms of whether or not it can be taught, I think it can be taught. I think it just has to be actually started at um, an earlier sort of um, academic setting sort of level to be able to then have future um, physicians that once they're in practice, be able to incorporate that into their future practices. And that often kind of can become more challenging when you're in an academic setting. But I think if you start early, that's when you can incorporate in the future. And if you can't do that, if that doesn't happen, I think there are plenty of learning opportunities, even post fellowship. Like I said, I kind of learned how to um, do several types of procedures just on my own and talking to various colleagues, keeping a close network with um, my former you know fellowship class and then even multiple colleagues within my field that were doing innovative things that i wanted to try to accomplish and so i think keeping that close net panels like this can be very helpful um, for growing physicians to be able to expand what their knowledge base is 
Great. And maybe as a follow on to that, Dr. Buchanan, how do you decide? I mean, I feel like I get an email every day with a new therapy, come learn to do this, come learn to do this. How do you make the decision about what, what of these uh, new and advanced minimally invasive spine procedures to actually incorporate into your practice? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Jessica. I uh, just want to introduce myself. My name is Patrick Buchanan. I'm in my fifth year out of fellowship, uh, and I'm doing private practice in Camarillo, California. So, you know, the, the first thing as it comes down to it, it, is the evidence, the evidence base, especially for a lot of these new and upcoming procedures. So a lot of them don't have, you know, that level one evidence um, because they're just starting out. Some of them are um, in the midst of doing uh, research. So just looking at the evidence such as, you know, the case reports, the presentate poster presentations at these conferences such as Aspen and um, all the way to the level one, level two studies that are going on is the most important thing in my book. Um, and then um, just talking with the, the faculty that have, have done these procedures and knowing the risks and the benefits, you know, many, many invasive procedures, the goal of that as us as pain physicians is to maximize the therapeutic effic efficacy and minimize patient risk. So just keeping that in mind through all these training sessions um, is key in my book. Excellent. Let's switch gears a little bit. And Dr. Pollard, can you talk to us a little bit about any challenges that um, you've had with credentialing for some of these procedures? I think a lot of times when we're, especially when we're just starting our practices and just trying to get kind of established, we get a little bit concerned about, you know, um, frankly, making the surgeons angry when we come up with these sort of new things that uh, clearly have a role in our opinion but maybe uh, present a little bit of a conflict with some of our surgical colleagues. Have you had challenges with that, with credentialing, and how have you overcome some of, the, some of those things? Yeah, absolutely. Great question, Dr. Jameson. So uh, my name is Morgan Pollard. I'm my first year out of fellowship, and um, I'm in private practice. I started a solo practice in Oklahoma. Uh, so I have faced um, kind of navigating these waters uh, uh, delicately. So I think the, the first things I would say is that um, you know, I got trained on these for the most part um, out of fellowship um, and then uh, kind of talked with some of the uh, other interventionalists and even some of the ortho and neurosurgeons that do spine procedures that do some of these things. Uh, talked to them about, you know, where it fits in their practice, um, talking to them about, you know, not, not necessarily trying to be, you know, competitor, but there are so many patients that can benefit from this um, that, are not good surgical candidates for a variety of reasons or just wouldn't be going to have the big open surgery anyway. So I think if they see you more as kind of an ally, they'll even, you know, sometimes send you some of these patients. And then I also um, made some kind of friendships there. And then that kind of helped me with getting privileges and getting um, credentialed with facilities. Um, because if it's something new that the facility hasn't done, they're going to want um, the spine um, people that are already there to be on board with it. Um, to one place kind of wanted me to have somebody that's willing to sort of proctor me, back me up and things like that, which I found to be really helpful. Um, and I've found that the companies um, will help arrange some of those things too. If you just ask them, I think that's uh, been helpful for me with my first couple of cases. Um, and then the only other thing I would add is that um, one interesting thing is that my malpractice insurance was not originally going to cover this. So if you're looking to add this to your practice, I would encourage you to uh, reach out to your malpractice coverage and make sure that, that you're getting that covered as well. Great, that's excellent. Um, Dr. Chopra, how about talking to us a little bit about what you see as the most exciting advances when it comes to uh, minimally invasive spine procedures, either over the past few years or into the future? Sure, that's a great question. Thanks, Dr. Jameson. I uh, just wanted to, oh, I just want to first introduce myself. My name is Pooja Chopra. Um, I am a recent graduate as of about, it's almost been a year now. Um, and I uh, just wanted to say hi to Dr. Deer and Dr. Saeed. Thank you so much to both of you guys and the entire Aspen team um, for this phenomenal event. So um, I just want to get started and say, you know, I think this is such a great and exciting time to be a pain physician. Um, the field is constantly evolving and we're really fortunate to have leaders in our field such as Dr. Deer and Dr. Saeed who are working relentlessly to um, push and advocate for, uh, really advocate for a patient-centric approach and um, I, in evidence-based uh, evidence medicine. 
And because of this, you know, our focus really has been more centered on research and data collection. And that has really helped us measure our outcomes and make the necessary changes um, to further make improvements in our field. And um, I think that can be also said for minimally invasive spinal procedures when you can see that the uh, benefits of this are very evident. Um, I would say the most exciting recent advances have been um, the minimally invasive lumbar decompression, the mild procedure, as well as the superior um, interspinous space replacement. Um, both of these, I mean, when you look at the benefits, um, both are outpatient procedures, which means that you know, the patients can go home the same day, which adds or contributes to uh, quicker recovery. Uh, with the mild procedure, there really is no implant. And uh, with Vertiflex, there is a small, very tiny implant when you compare it to uh, the more traditional open or um, more invasive spinal procedures. And because these are both minimally invasive procedures, um, there's smaller incisions, shorter intra-op times, as well as decreased amounts of post-op analgesia requirements. So all of this really contributes to faster recovery and um, improved functional gains. And when you think about it, that's really the essence of our field is improvement in pain as well as um, uh, improved functionality. So I think that, you know, We've made like great strides in our field, and I'm really optimistic to see in the coming years the innovation um, that will allow for better modalities and um, to help us better take care of our patients. Wonderful. I think I lost Jessica there, so I'm going to ask a question to Dr. Jane. Dr. Jane, you've really uh, at a very early stage been involved in uh, literature development with, you know, things like minimally invasive lumbar decompression uh, and other things. What is, you know, where do you think we're going, you know, uh, as far as, you know, our field of minimally invasive spine? Do you think we're going to go more invasive? Uh, are we going to go less invasive or, or are things going to blend? I think, uh, uh, so for, uh, I'm Samir Jain practicing in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, that's a great question, Daud, and I believe, I think it's, uh, we need to have a proper blend of uh, minimally invasive and <clears throat> uh, normal routine train procedures because uh, we are not tr uh, trying to be surgeons here, and that's something that we need to convince our surgical colleagues too, as <clears throat> most of these minimally invasive spine procedures that we are doing right now they are no more than more invasive than let's say a pain pump implant or kyphoplasty, which we all know that pain physicians have been doing for decades. So we are not trying to encroach uh, surgical space. Uh, and also why we are doing these procedures is because we know that epidural injections, RFA, don't work on every patient. And most of these patients, <clears throat> so there's a large volume of patients that are not surgical candidates <clears throat> because either they have comorbidities or uh, do not meet the criteria for surgery. So I think for those patients, uh, these minimally invasive spine procedures offer a great value. And uh, I think uh, if we can uh, <clears throat> find uh, more procedures that can be incorporated into pain practices, that'll be really great for the patients. Samir, I think that comment it really is uh, very accurate, and I think the panel's been amazing. I think all the answers were incredible. Dr. Jameson had a lightning storm and lost her uh, her feed, so she, she sends her apologies of a text. Uh, I, I just want to say one closing comment on this panel. I think uh, everyone's insights are right on right on the money. I think two things have to happen. We have to get the uh, program directors around the country to learn these procedures and teach them to fellows. And I think that's important. The program directors get on board and get very good at these procedures. It makes it easier as you come out. And you don't have to just do that search that Patrick talked about. Secondly, I think we're gonna win the battle because of patient safety and <laughs> All panelists, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, so I think that everyone was muted now. You have to unmute yourself again to get that last one off. So thank you all very much. Thanks for this panel and thank Dr. Jameson for uh, leading it. Hope to see you all in Miami.
Rabbi Dawood. Thank you, Dr. Okay. We'll go to the next panel. Thanks, everybody. That was a great, uh, great uh, musical outro uh, there at the end. We're going to talk about um, you're really evident, and, and I think in the last panel, Samir Jane mentioned evidence, and uh, this leads us to our next discussion with our guest moderator, uh, our friend Dr. Christian Chakrabarthy. So, uh, Dawood, back to you and Christian. Yeah, yeah Dr. Chakrabarthy has been, you know, you know, one of the great leaders of our society and our field. Uh, he serves as the chair of the Translational Research Committee, which is, you know, I, I failed to mention at the beginning, you know, there's been some committees that have done a tremendous amount of work already, and uh, that committee has done, you know, many things, several publications already, and uh, really uh, all due to Christian's leadership. So, Christian, take it from here. All right, awesome. So, um, I, I think everybody shares these sen sentiments that um, in no other time in pain medicine do we see so many papers and uh, level one evidence and the quality of the manuscripts that are getting published in either JAMA, Lancet. So this first question is to my good friend, Dr. Escobar. Um, you know, I, I think as you continue to, there's evidence grows in this space for different indications and different therapies. How do you decide um, to translate that evidence into decisions in your clinical practice? Thanks, Krishnan, and hello, everyone. I'm Alex Escobar. I'm practicing in Toledo, Ohio, uh, in a private practice setting uh, with the university affiliation at the University of Toledo. And incorporating you know, any new innovation, I think it's critical that we look at safety, uh, followed by efficacy, and then least importantly, cost effectiveness in my practice. Anytime a new indication arises, it's important that we're able to you know, uh, grade the level of evidence. Uh, just because it's a randomized controlled trial uh, doesn't equate to um, that quality being uh, something that you can directly translate uh, clinically or changing your practice. And despite it being a case series, um, doesn't mean something that is lower quality of evidence. Therefore, I think there's a balance in identifying uh, evidence-based practices. I think all of us on the panel and on the uh, call tonight would agree that our specialty is moving in the right direction, uh, that we're having formal training to provide uh, physicians uh, the most uh, advanced arsenal of tools to address our uh, challenges in chronic pain. I think it's more important uh, than identifying non-surgical candidates. I think it's critical that we identify those that would benefit from a formal open decompression or surgical intervention. I think one thing, looking back at fellowship that we didn't do enough, and what I try to incorporate every day with my fellows, is identifying those patients that would benefit from a formal uh, a surgical approach. And I think that we can't um, get too big for our britches and think we can treat everything and identifying those that would benefit from a surgical intervention is critical. Really good point. Um, so uh, on that line of thinking, I Ryan, this next question is for you, and I had the pleasure of meeting you and as well speaking to you at length about um, developing this concepts around biomarkers and the future of kind of how we're looking at and qualifying the types of evidence that we're gathering. Um, do you think VASCOR is too simplistic? Are we getting to the point where uh, we really need to reevaluate how we're assessing the efficacy of the different therapies that are in our in our space, and really saying one is better or worse based on something more than just the vascular. I wanted to thank everybody. You know, it's really a pleasure to be with everybody on this panel tonight. Uh, my name is Ryan Budwani. I'm in the last year of my residency here at WBU, and I think you know the vascular. Um, I think it's time has passed. And the reason I say that is because, you know, there are so many ways to figure out how can we better meet the needs of our patients. At the end of the day, it's really about what is that telling us about what the patient wants to do with the intervention that we're providing them. And so I think the challenge with that score is that, that it does not clearly define, you know, what does the patient get at the end of the day? Sure, their score does, might go down, it might improve, but does that really improve their function? Does that improve their ability to do what they want to do. And so I think that's a challenge. I think that when we try to address some of these issues, we need to look at their quality of life measure, you know, their activity of daily living sports. You know, are those the things that are being met? Because that's really unique amongst each individual. So I think that's really the challenge. And I think with the new tools that are we, we are getting every single day as those evolve, 
I think that with that and the development of a better understanding of which biomarkers pertain to acute and potentially chronic pain, you know, we might be able to better meet those needs for our patients. And so while I think that for the time being, it's one point that is telling us where the patient is at currently, it does not really give us the full picture. And if we address function, I think that's where the success is. And so I think that's kind of where our focus should be at this point. I love that. Um, this next question is to Dr. Shaw. Um, so, you know, I, I think one of the challenges that a lot of uh, pain clinicians have today, and I, I get the benefit of teaching five wonderful fellows every year at UCSD Health is, um, how do I get to educating and really getting to qualifying and putting all of these studies in one category versus another. Um, I know that you've been a currently a fellow or resident at UPMC and you wanted to kind of address this. What mechanism of education has really helped in deciphering through all these studies? What's What can make it easier, harder? Just wanted to hear your opinion on that. Thank you for the question. Uh, my name is Neil, uh, fourth year resident at UPMC. Uh, so one of the things, this has been a common issue in our, our residency, we have journal clubs and many residents brought up the fact that we have all these great articles, but it's really difficult to really understand what exactly is being um, taught and how we can really apply it to our clinical practice. So what we decided to do was to carve out 15 minutes or so of our journal club to really come back to our basic statistical skills. Um, you know, what is the t-test, what are p-values, something that was particularly used in that article that was used for our analysis and just refresh our, our minds on those statistical concepts because that can help you put that uh, information in better context. But I think along with just having more routine conversations with other partners that you work with, um, you know, we have a great panel of pain physicians across the country and also locally wherever everyone is working. Um, as more research comes out, more papers are published, um, I think that there's a role and a value of having discussions similar to these, like we are on a webinar about some of these newer papers and newer modalities. Um, what do the other experts in the field think about some of the studies that are published and how can they be uh, better used in clinical practice? Uh, you know, there's always new technology that's going to be presented, but, uh, you know, what can that, how can that be uh, incorporated in what you do and what are the pitfalls? Those that have more experience may be better and more easily able to identify that even though that their results were really great, there could be this potential patient issue or this reimbursement issue from insurance. So uh, we all have to all help each other and educate each other moving forward on that aspect. Great. So the next question goes to Dr. Gish and Dr. Khatri. Of the recent evidence that has come out in the pain space, what is the what is the one that you think is most impactful? What are you excited about? Um, what do you, would you like to see explored further? And start with okay. Dr. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm Brandon Gish. I practice in Lexington, Kentucky. I'm in my fourth year out. Uh, obviously, there's a lot to choose from here. I'd say the first one I would uh, highlight actually builds on your question about the VAS score. The Triumph study, very, very little mentioned VAS at all and actually focused mostly on psychosocial effects and, and physical outcomes yeah, and, and specifically uh, included patients with depression, uh, whereas previous uh, studies excluded patients with depression. So I think that does open a little bit uh, as far as patients that we feel are appropriate candidates for spinal cord stimulation. Uh, and, and then a couple others, we had, a, we had an entire panel on the minimally invasive decompression. Uh, the MISC guidelines, obviously, are very important. I think put pain management on the map to some degree. Uh, Intercept is, is fairly new to me, but promising um, in regards to treating uh, discogenic pain. Uh, and then a, sort of bread and butter in my practice, uh, the BOLD study, uh, really improving um, battery life, reducing energy use, maybe even um, some habituation. So obviously lots to choose from, but those are a couple of my favorites. Okay. Dr. Khatri? Hey guys, uh, I'm Nasser Khatri. I'm a, a fourth year a CA3 at uh, UNC and I'll be doing fellowship at Kansas next year actually. Um, 
so, you know, first of all, uh, I'm super excited to be speaking today and thanks for having me on. Um, the, the sort of the literature and all the research going on in pain medicine right now is really what attracted me to the field in the first place. And, you know, being so new in my career, I, I sort of foresee pain medicine really in the going in the same direction that cardiology has over the past 30, 40 years or so with the advancements in their therapeutics and in their diagnostic skills and everything. And I, I foresee that with the use of technology um, that, that we have in pain medicine, really um, that we'll sort of be um, heading in, the, in their direction. Uh, and so along those lines, the study to, that you know, sort of most recently came out was um, Erica Peterson and Nandan, Lad, Nandan Lad's um, sort of study that was published in JAMA, the Senza trial, uh, evaluating the efficacy of high-frequency um, spinal cord stimulation on patients with um, painful diabetic neuropathy. Um, just another example of a of a condition that has really affected so many people for so long. And while there have been both pharmacologic and interventional um, therapies uh, that have been used for quite some time, this is an example of cutting-edge research. Um, using a new therapeutic uh, modality uh, really to help uh, a lot of patients. Um, and, and, and so I think that's a study that for me uh, was very interesting to read. Yeah, I, I love that analogy because I, I've heard that a few times um, that, you know, pain medicine today is where cardiology was to a large extent and it's uh, kind of its major inflection point of growth. So this next question actually piggybacks on that concept. Um, one of the things that changed the field of cardiology at that time was the advent of comparator trials. So when they started looking at um, similar indications and then really comparing one treatment to another. So this question is to Dr. Patel. Um, do you think that pain medicine is ready for that to start having these device companies really look at indications and do comparator trials with one waveform versus another? Do you think we're at that point or do you think that that's still a ways away for us? Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you for that question. I'm Alopi Patel. I'm at Mount Sinai uh, West in New York City and I'm about three years out. Um, so I do think that, you know, even though this is a relatively newer field, that I think it is time. I think we, like you said, we're at that inflection point and Research is always good, especially if we can compare it to um, different areas. So uh, especially now that we have been in the field for a while in terms of neuromodulation, it would be good to see the literature uh, compare uh, the different sort of waveforms and uh, the devices as well. So I do think that we are at that uh, junction. Simon Dawood, any other questions? Great job, panelists. Yeah, no, great job by, by everyone. I just want to make sure that Dr. Khatri is uh, going to enjoy his last week of freedom because uh, starting July 1st, he's going to be in the uh, University of Kansas Pain Medicine Institution uh, incarceration for a year. <laughs> Great job, everybody. Oh, look. I think uh, we still have a question for Ed, though, I think. Uh... Uh, I think they'll think we asked asked Ed a question. Ed, we want to actually, make sure. Yeah, actually, I, had, I did have a question for Ed in specific. Ed has actually a, a very unique interest in cancer pain management, from my understanding. Uh, can you kind of give us a little bit insight in kind of the research uh, in the field of uh, medical oncology pain management and where it should go and what's kind of inspired you so far? Sure. Thank you guys uh, very much for having me. I'm currently a fellow at MD Anderson. And uh, I have the distinct privilege and honor to follow in the footsteps of the late uh, Lisa Stearns. So I'm really excited about the future. I'll be out in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona in a couple of months. So I'll be looking for a lot of advice from you guys. And uh, so I think to answer your question, uh, we need to, you know, set a little context here in terms of the level of evidence that's already exists. Uh, the survey that came out looking at, uh, you know, People's thoughts on the most recent PAC guidelines was very enlightening, uh, enlightening to me. Uh, specifically, um, you know, out of the recommendations that came out of the PAC guidelines, 20 of those were only of level three evidence, and 10 of those were level I evidence. Um, so we really have a long way to go. I think uh, 
you know, there's two distinct groups within the intrathecal drug delivery space. There's the non-cancer pain population and the cancer pain population. I think we have some barriers there in terms of combining the two. So I'd really like to see those things split in future PAC guidelines. Uh, it's very different to take care of a patient uh, who's got non-cancer pain versus somebody like I had the other day who was on uh, over 2,000 morphine equivalents of opioids. Uh, you have to be much more aggressive with those patients, and I think there's some good evidence coming out. Uh, recently, one of the examples of that was the article by Brogan at the University of Utah talking about 101 conversion of uh, systemic opioids to intrathecal versus the dogmatic or traditional approach of 300 to 1. Uh, so I think, you know, more evidence is needed, obviously, in our space. Uh, you talk a little bit about comparison studies. I think that's also important. Very difficult in the cancer pain population to, uh, you know, do prospective placebo-controlled uh, trials, obviously, for uh, ethical reasons. So I'd really like to see some comparison studies. It'd be great to see something like the 100 to 1 conversion uh, compared to the 300, one, 300 to 1 conversion. So have a lot of way, ways to go and looking forward to the future and being part of uh, generating some more evidence for the field. Thank you guys very much for having me. Dr. Cotterosi, that was a great answer. Uh, Lisa Turns is a good friend of mine. So uh, I, if I can help you in any way, let me know. Uh, we have uh, Shane Brogan and uh, uh, Mansoor Amon and others are leading a new can interventional cancer pain guideline from Aspen. It's been already written and submitted, so you'll see that coming. Hopefully, you can be involved in the next one of those in a few years. And uh, the winner of this of this panel to me is Ryan uh, Bawandi because he's got a West Virginia flag behind him. So that's that gets brownie points uh, with me for sure. Great job, everyone. That was a phenomenal panel. I think all your answers were tremendous. I'm very impressed. So thank you so much. We'll go to our next panel. We have two panels left to go. Uh, and this panel uh, is near and dear to my heart uh, because I love. Uh, the research I've done in both these areas, uh, purple nerve and dorsal ganglion stimulation. Our guest moderator is uh, our good friend, David Lee. And uh, Dawood, back to you. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this is, again, I think something that uh, a lot of us have a lot of interest and in. we know that this is one of those areas in our field that is just uh, essentially in its infancy. So a lot of new interest and research on this. So I think it's gonna be really unique to have uh, Dr. David Lee uh, speak uh, with our panel here about uh, peripheral nerve stimulation and uh, ERG stimulation as uh, new modes of pain treatment. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Dawood, for the introduction. Um, when I was approached to uh, be a guest moderator, I was uh, humbled. And uh, then I started looking back at how long I've been practicing and I've been out for a fellowship for about nine years. Uh, and then when I was given the topic um, that I'm going to be moderating, I realized PNS and, and, and DRG didn't even exist at that point in time. And it wasn't even a concept, uh, probably just started as, you know, this kind of philosophical idea um, of being able to stimulate elsewhere outside of the dorsal column. So um, I, I'm, I'm really happy because it's combining a, a love of, uh, of my own, my uh, personal passion for neuromodulation, and then also working with a lot of upcoming fellows. Um, some of the people on this call are a little bit out beyond that, and so I'm really excited to hear what uh, they have to say and add about the, the, the topic at hand here. So um, just so to say, like when I call on uh, you guys for the questions, make sure you guys introduce yourselves. I'm going to make sure you guys get your uh, appropriate face time. They know who you guys are. So I'm going to kind of jump right into it. Uh, so I'm going to start with Dr. Aruru um, and also Dr. Ghosh. Uh, the first question will be, uh, where do you see, in particularly indications uh, and diagnoses, uh, PNS and DRG fitting within our treatment algorithm, particularly compared to traditional uh, dorsal column spinal cord stimulation? I'll start with Dr. Aru. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at the DRG components of that question. So thanks, for, uh, thanks Dr. Deer, thanks Dr. Syed for this really cool chance to talk about the things we do in our, in our individual practices and and for all that you do with ASPN, my name is Dr. Rura. I practice here at UPMC, Williamsport, Pennsylvania. And, you know, it's been pretty cool, actually, to really see some of the applications of DRG for the patients that I work with. You know, on label, you know, DRG, you can use it for CRPS type 1, causalgia. But what's been really, you know, the, the case that I did was kind of interesting, was looking at patients outside of that population, especially patients who are in between. They're going to get surgery. 
but not getting surgery, especially for your knees. It's almost like bone on bone, but the surgeons do not want to operate. And it's hitting that concept of severe osteoarthritis. I, I think it would be very interesting to really see if there's a role for, for DRG among patients who actually have severe osteoarthritis, but are not going to require surgery anytime soon. You know, that patient population is very, very interesting because it's growing, it's getting bigger, and for some reason, we're not capturing it. I had a successful trial and implantation for a patient who came in with a wheelchair and did phenomenal. It was off-label, so I had to talk the insurance to really approve this, but she, she's doing very well, and it's and it's been a, it's been a very great experience. So, so the summary would be, it, it would be very interesting to see if we can, if we can see more light shed on osteoarthritis of the knee and even the ankle um, for patient, you know, in terms of utilization of DRG. Yeah, that's great. So we'll turn that question over then to Dr. Ghosh. Yeah, so I'm Priyanka Ghosh. I work in California. I'm in a private practice and thanks to Tim and Dawit for having me and thanks to David for moderating. So I think peripheral nerve stimulation really has an unlimited field of application. I mean, it's probably the one type of stimulation we now have where we can target almost directly what is affecting the patient, whether we're doing multifidus or we're doing things like suprascapular axillary nerves. There's so many very targeted areas we can get to, which before we couldn't. And I think that peripheral nerve stimulation is not a new concept, but with the better technology, the better anchoring, the different types, patterns, temporary and and permanent, I think that it's opening up a whole new world to target pain syndromes that can't be targeted with dorsal column or DRG, which is really just amazing for us as, as physicians who can really help them in the whole gamut of their pain syndromes. And I think it's a great way, honestly, to reduce so much of the opiate use we have right now, that especially went up during the pandemic, to target their exact areas instead of saying, sorry, we don't have anything for you. And actually this weekend I was in, Vegas at a conference talking to Dr. Amon about his really interesting uh, application of PNS for um, actually knee pain. So I think later in the conversation, we'll have to hear about that. But I've definitely used it interestingly for frozen shoulders, for suprascapular and axillary nerves. And it's done really well for my patients and decreased a lot of um, medication usage. So I'm excited to see all the targeted things we can do with them. Thanks, Dr. Ghosh. So uh, you guys bring up good points here. You know, oftentimes, uh, the PNS and DRG conversation gets grouped together. In fact, Aspen's had um, debates on it uh, in, in the past as well, and obviously a, a point of discussion here today. So I'm going to turn it to uh, Dr. Lawson Smith and also Dr. Oman, um, since, Dr., since Dr. Ghosh mentioned uh, him uh, specifically. So which which do you guys prefer? And maybe not a fair question, but we're going to, since they tend to get grouped together, PNS or uh, DRG for limiting and why? And we'll start off with uh, Dr. Dr. and Dr. Saeed for putting this together. Um, for me, when it comes to limb pain, uh, you know, everything is patient centered. And so what that means is if I think that there is an identifiable, identifiable nerve injury going on, then maybe we try peripheral nerve stimulation before we jump to dorsal ganglion stimulation. Um, there are many factors at play there. Um, the first being, will their insurance cover it? Um, I'll, we're getting a lot of pushback, um, at least you know here in Arkansas where I practice, that there's just not enough data to support peripheral nerve stimulation for a lot of therapies um, that I want to use it for. Um, and so it's been a, a fight there to try to get it approved uh, for my patients. Whereas door through ganglion stimulation, I feel like insurance companies have uh, better data to suggest that that might be a therapy that uh, would uh, be more amenable to these patients' types of pain. Um, so with that said, if I had to choose between peripheral nerve stimulation and door through ganglion stimulation, uh, just anecdotally for me, uh, right now, taking my patient into account, it's about their goals. Uh, what type of function do they hope to achieve afterward? Because to me, that's that's the big deal is what kind of function do, they, do you hope to achieve out of this? I have a lot of patients who are not very fond of the idea about anything going into their spine. Um, and because of that, maybe we try the peripheral nerve stimulation route if we can get it approved. 
another thing that I like about um, at least Sprint is that we're taking this out in 60 days. It's going to be a temporary system. Temporary system. So if I can place a device in that allows my patient to get uh, relief and then I can take it out and there's nothing left behind, then that's uh, a game changer. Uh, alternatively, what happens if that doesn't work? And then at that point, I feel like moving to dorsal ganglion simulation, something that if it really helps can be implanted permanently uh, is their best option. Yeah, that, that's great. You know, I like that answer to that question. It, that hits home for me too, because I do think that sometimes we we do group them in one versus the other, but you could potentially use them simultaneously or even in lieu of one another. If one fails, then you can always use one as an alternative. Dr. Aman, I'm going to turn it over here. Uh, Dr. Ghosh mentioned that you had an interesting case of the knee. Uh, you want to? I think we're having a little uh, introduce yourself. Yeah, I think we're having some uh, feedback on Dr. Rahman's microphone here. So, Dr. Rahman, I'm going to come back to you in just a second. Okay, um, we'll let you get that fixed up here. So I'm, I'm going to turn the question over to uh, Dasha, Dr. Uh, Grant Karch, uh, if, if you guys, if you don't mind. Again, the question would be, um, if you have given a choice for PNS or DRG in the limb, which would you choose and why? Thank you, Dr. Lee, for the question, and thank you uh, for having me here today. Uh, my name is Natasha Grankarik. I'm uh, in the faculty practice over at Columbia here in New York City. Um, and I think, uh, you know, between PNS and DRG, the decision for me would be, uh, including um, what was mentioned before, do I expect this patient, it's, it's kind of patient specific, right? So would I expect the patient to be experiencing a more chronic pain syndrome or do I expect, what is the timeline of this pain? Is it an acute post-operative process, in which case I would favor something like PNS over DRG, of course, or is this something that this patient's gonna live with for a long time? I might consider DRG in that case. And then also, you know, what is the distribution of the pain? Is it really nerve specific or is it more dermatomal? Uh, in nature, and then I would favor DRG over that. So there are a couple of different considerations uh, that are patient specific, and especially patients that are, you know, maybe not as health or tech savvy or older patients, and how will they, you know, react to the technology? Will they be able to use it? Um, and including their comorbidities as well, are all considerations I would take into uh, deciding between the two. That's great. That's great. And one of, interestingly enough, one of the applications for, you know, particularly Sprint, we've, you know, talked about with Dr. Chagavarthi is, you know, post-operative care because it, it is a temporary uh, peripheral nerve stimulation. Great answer. Dr. Mon, how are we doing with your microphone? We good? I think we're looking better. Good evening, everyone. My okay. Awesome. Well, um, I'm actually going to change the question here a little bit because uh, um, we have a, a few more questions here. Um, so outside of traditional limb pain, uh, what other diagnosis do you potentially see PNS or DRG being used? Dr. Ghosh did mention that you used it in the knee. You can certainly elaborate on that uh, if you, or any other interesting case that you may have done recently. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think outside of traditional limb pain, there's a role for uh, PNS in facial pain and headaches, occipital neuralgia. I've used it for superorbital neuralgia um, at the front of the face uh, for that indication. Both PNS and DRG have had uh, pretty good success with uh, chronic pelvic pain. Um, as well as uh, chronic abdominal pain. And I think that, you know, the case that Dr. Ghosh was referring to earlier was really related to my algorithms and how these therapies changed my algorithms and how I practice. And if you saw me in 2018 with post-total knee arthroplasty pain, they might have undergone a genicular nerve frequency lesioning procedure. Um, and, uh, you know, trigger pain turned the following year uh, at this juncture, if they get a year of relief, I definitely offer them that repeat procedure. But kind of going back to one of my uh, mentors, what they taught me was one of the biggest things we can give patients is hope. And I feel that both PNS and DRG offer our patients hope. And so my algorithm changed where, you know, uh, the most uh, implicated nerve in post knee arthroplasty pain is the infracatellar branch of the saphenous nerve. So now I commonly utilize the vector canal blocks in office as diagnostic and go ahead and either use uh, purple nerve stimulation uh, or go ahead and switch gears and um, utilize dorsal root ganglion. 
and I agree completely with what with with what Dr. Uh, Smith also alluded to uh, in regards to knowing which therapy to offer when. Uh, <clears throat> Great. Yeah, I've actually used both DRG and, and, and PNS and specifically PNS for the infrapatellar branch myself too. So Dr. Akaza, I'm going to turn it to you. Same question. Uh, any, uh, I guess, uh, off-label or in interesting cases in terms of where you see PNS and DRG being used uh, now or in the future? Hi, so thank you. Uh, my name is Eduardo Akaza. I'm in practice in a uh, multi-specialty group uh, in Southeast Michigan. Um, and like the other uh, panelists have mentioned, there's there's lots of great uh, applications. Um, you know, for me in particular, uh, when I think about peripheral nerve stimulation, uh, I work in a multi-specialty group, so I see a lot of uh, acute pain from my stroke colleagues. Uh, so for me, this is an area where there's a great opportunity to think kind of outside the chronic pain management, uh, help out our colleagues, help out. Uh, the patients um, and really maybe intervene uh, before a lot of these patients go on the chronic pain route. Uh, so specifically, uh, identifying those patients that uh, might be pharmacalgia, uh, maybe they have failed back surgery, uh, but they're going to get uh, joint replacement surgery. Uh, and so if we can help identify those patients, help care for them maybe a little bit earlier, uh, that could obviously help uh, the patients and, um, you know, helps help save uh, healthcare dollars. Um, but for me, I think that's uh, that's a great role for this. All right, and not last but not least, Dr. Uh, Ramsuk, we're gonna give you the last question here. Where do you believe there's a lack of research and data? And this is a little, you know, uh, you know, overlap from the previous panel, uh, but specifically in PNS and DRG. Hi everyone. Good evening. Thanks for having me. Uh, I just wanted to kind of just backtrack just for for 10 seconds and kind of, I think it's important to understand where we may have a little bit of a bias in terms of where we were trained, what we were trained on and our practice environment, because I think that goes a long way into this kind of this PNS versus DRG discussion. If you were trained in a situation where it was very heavily DRG, um, and you didn't have as much exposure, just like with any procedure that you may not be comfortable with, you may not be as likely to kind of push forward with that if you're, if you're uncomfortable with it. Um, I've had the pleasure of training with, with Ken Chapman and Kieran Patel up in, up in New York, and uh, they've done some wonderful things over there. And I can even just say my own biases that we've that probably done more DRG than peripheral nerve stimulation. Um, I think there's a place for both. I think that understanding our biases first off is important, but also, uh, I think that we need to really make sure we continue to take into consideration the patients that we're looking at. It's not just a cookie cutter, one size fits all, all knee pains are the same knee pains, right? So there's patients who are not gonna be happy with recharging. There's gonna be patients that don't want something externalized. There's, you know, it's, those things are important to kind of understand. Uh, so I just wanna kind of throw that out there real quick. In terms of research related things, I think there's a ton of amazing things going on. Um, you know, I'm interesting to, interested to see the continued research and related to more of these mechanical pain issues, um, you know, the bilateral T12s, which Dr. Chapman has been kind of um, promoting as well, has worked phenomenally well. And I think that similar types of situations like that are just going to continue to expand the field and be able to provide us with a little bit more um, uh, avenues in which we can better utilize this in, a, in an on-label, hopefully in the future kind of way. So. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Dr. Ramsuk. We, we are running out of time here. We can probably ask these questions uh, and go a little bit further with mo most of the panelists, but I want to thank everybody. I'm going to turn it back over to Dawood. If you have any questions, uh, we can wrap up here. But thank you all panelists for, uh, for being on tonight. You have a great, great. job. Uh, I think your moderating was spot on. Uh, you know, I think what's really exciting is that you, know, you guys are so uh, early in your careers and you already are very adept at choosing the right candidates from what we know now and I loved all the answers a lot of research going on at the University of Wisconsin on joint pain for DRG so Rory I think you may see that come to fruition down the road peripheral nerve uh, for new mechanisms a lot of work being done on things like vascular supply and flow with PNS and DRG so it's very exciting so this panel has been tremendous I wish you all a wonderful night and thank you so much for being here tonight and great job good job everyone now we got, I think we're going to, our, I think it's our last panel uh, before we get into our closing thoughts. And now uh, we have a great guest moderator, a dear friend of mine, uh, Dr. Stephen Falowski, a neurosurgeon from uh, the great state of Pennsylvania. And uh, back to you, Dawood. 
Yeah, well, uh, Dr. Falowski has been, you know, a really great asset and ally and kind of um, essentially, you know, one of the, you know, thought leaders really when it comes to innovative, newer, less invasive ways uh, for us to take care of our patients. And he's really embraced the concept. Uh, he's kind of been an early adopter of recognizing that really it's not a, a surgeon versus interventionalist. It's really about getting the appropriate therapies in, in the right, you know, physician's hands. So we're going to talk about, you know, collaborating with our surgical colleagues uh, as well as our uh, inter classically trained interventionalists and how we can avoid, you know, turf battles and focus more on outcomes. Dr. Falowski. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dawood, and thank you, Tim. Uh, we'll try to take it home with a, a good last session here. Um, I've been come to be known as like sort of that token neurosurgeon that shows up at all the pain meetings. But uh, I think one of the things that I've tried to work very actively at is is bridging that gap between interventional pain and and spine surgeons. And I think times have have changed tremendously. Uh, the skill set and the procedures that interventional pain is now doing it is growing tremendously and it's beyond what we've seen years before and i think that's uh, created a lot of turmoil turmoil and kind of turf battles between surgeons and pain physicians and i think a lot of it just has to do with education um, i think the, the spine surgeons are not educated on these new therapies and i think the spine surgeons have not adopted a lot of these therapies even previously and interventional pain is taking over and really pushing the uh, the technology and innovation forward. So I think it's an exciting time. Um, I think it's an interesting time where we have to learn to, to work together and I think bridge that gap and, and have these relationships. And I think we're starting to see that between MIS with minimally invasive spine, especially in neuromodulation and even the papers that are being written around this. So what I'm going to do is try to engage a, a lot of the panel here. Um, I'll probably ask the uh, same question to at least two people on the panel just to kind of get Two different perspectives on it and i think one of the things i want to first start with because we have a very young panel is how do you see yourself starting relationships with you know with spine surgeons so you're coming into practice you're starting an interventional pain program you want to do a lot of these new uh, innovative procedures uh, but you also want to maintain your referral base with with the surgeon so how do you see yourself starting those relationships so I'm going to start off with uh, Dr. Murthy, and then we're going to have Dr. Allen follow up on that. So starting with you, Raj, and please introduce yourself first as well. Yeah, sure. Hi, hi everyone. My name is uh, Raj Murthy. I'm currently a PGY5 pain fellow at North Hill Health and the Spine and Pain Institute of New York. Um, um, you know, this is a great topic to be on because at the conclusion of my fellowship, I'm actually going to be joining a well-renowned neurosurgeon and create the pain aspect of his pain management program. So I think um, as pain physicians, when it comes to procedures that kind of bound between interventional pain and pain management, such as like a mild procedure or vertiflex, I think open communication is key with your neurosurgeon counterpart. I think you need to be transparent with them, um, explain that the knowledge you have of the procedure, show the statistics that's present as well, and also the experience that you gained in your training if you're comfortable doing it. I think uh, by having that open communication, that's going to go key with them and not only build their trust, but also, you know, uh, improve the well-being of your patient. And I think that's probably one of the most important things to do at the end of the day. Thanks. Yeah, um, I'm Forrest Allen. I'm uh, about three years out. Uh, I'm in a large orthopedic practice here in Nashville. Uh, thank you guys for having me. Uh, I agree 100% with what he just said. Um, I work with two spine surgeons already, and uh, we're having a, a third and actually a fourth coming on. And so, you know, it's so important to maintain good relationship. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep, absolutely. Sorry. Uh, it's so important to maintain good relationships with these uh, with surgeons. And so, you know, I try to be in constant communication with them, whether that's through text or a phone call. Uh, I go out to dinner with them sometimes, we have lunch together. Um, just having that uh, interaction and, um, and bouncing, off, uh, bouncing ideas off one another is important and also kind of makes them comfortable with the procedures you do. And, um, you know, cause there's a lot of overlap. You know, we can, you know, kyphoplasty, um, stimulator, intercept, you know, there's a lot of things that they can do that we also can do. Um, but just always maintaining that communication, um, you know, being on good terms with them. And, um, you know, these are the people that are going to 
feed your practice and help grow your practice. So um, it's just important to to really maintain those relationships and really try to develop them as best you can. I think actually that, that's spot on, uh, Dr. Allen. And actually, I want to build off one of the things you said because I think a lot of the ways that we were trained and went through our residency and potentially our fellowship, uh, we probably were trained or, or thought of surgeons in a certain way. But then as we came into practice now, and I think even the transition that we've seen over the last three to five years, there's been a big difference in how that relationship exists between surgeons and, and pain physicians. In fact, I think actually we're even starting to see more uh, spine surgeons, orthopedic spine, neurosurgery spine, go into private practice, join into surgery centers, and start doing more procedures on an outpatient basis. So I'm going to actually address this question to, to Dr. Young uh, and then Dr. Feldheim after him. Um, so how do you how do you see that change occurred from when you went through training uh, to what you're actually seeing now, and then how do you implement uh, relationships with surgeons in your practice? Uh, Mike and sir, I'm Mike Jung. I'm uh, attending at UC Davis. Um, I'm the associate program director of the Pain Fellowship with Dr. Pritzlock. You can say I'm his hype man. Um, anyways, uh, we have are fortunate at our academic center to have a very good relationship uh, with the spine surgeons. In particular, uh, our particular relationship is with neurosurgery spine surgery, which has been very fruitful. And so the question I think is how to maintain those relationships. Um, so things that we've done that we've implemented are uh, dual specialty neurosurgery pain management boards where we'll discuss patients every two months, mutual patients. And it's actually been really well appreciated by the surgeons because um, they have difficult patients and they want to know how we can help them. Um, another avenue, and this is more on the academic side, is research. Uh, I think co-publishing together is a great way to build a collaborative relationship. That's something that Dr. Flowski does uh, all the time with the pain physicians here. And so that's something I, I, I've tried to keep in mind as well. So we have a, a, a manuscript we're publishing with one of the neuro, um, spine surgeons here, and then we submit it at ASRA and things like that. And I think that's a great way to build a collaborative kind of alliance outside of the clinical realm. And so both clinically with mutual discussions, maybe a neurosurgery pain board you know where you kind of like a cancer board or on research endeavors outside of the clinical realm i think are great ways to uh, foster that collaboration thank you yeah so um i'm tim feldheim i'm actually just finishing up my fellowship at uh university hospitals in cleveland um so i can't really talk about you know having established it in, in private practice or outside, but I've been fortunate to train at places where there's been a lot of collaboration between both, um, you know, spine surgery and uh, the, the pain medicine department, um, you know, and again, I think it's a collaborative effort and trying to do what's right for the patient. And I think, you know, communication, like has already kind of, kind of been said, and, and education of, uh, you know, both the, the spine surgeons um, as well as they're, you know, educating us, you know, what's an appropriate patient that we um, might be better suited with some of the techniques that we have to offer versus, you know, us finding patients that, you know, kind of really, surgery is the only really kind of true option at this point that's really going to take care of their pain. Um, and furthermore, that goes past spine surgery as well. We are uh, very fortunate here to work with uh, a very good uh, functional neurosurgery group. And we do a lot of collaboration with them as well. So I think just having those open communications and kind of you know educating one another as new techniques develop and, and new um, therapies are out there is the key to just fostering that, that, that good uh, collaborative effort moving forward. Absolutely. Um, so for these last couple of questions, I'm actually going to direct them at specific people. So this is for you, Dr. Vanities. Um, specifically, neuromodulation, spinal cord stim. Um, there's many different ways people can put it into their practice where surgeons doing trials and implants, pain physicians doing trials and implants, or some kind of some kind of hybrid model. And then it's a hybrid, whether it's surgery center and hospital or, or spine surgeon and pain physician together. How do you fit neuromodulation and that relationship into your practice? 
Sure. So I'm Tony Van Tisi. I'm in private practice uh, in Pennsylvania, and I have kind of a unique uh, scenario with this, fortunately, that Dr. Falowski and my practice are in a collaborative research agreement, and we also share a surgery center. So getting to work with a functional neurosurgeon like that is, is very beneficial in that, that situation where uh, I tend to do the trials and I send almost all of my implants to Dr. Falowski. And I think that has helped that relationship and uh, just been able to kind of nurture that to where I learn from him as far as what patients are appropriate for certain procedures that I don't do, that he does do. And um, we can kind of work back and forth and have cases that I do that he doesn't do that we can um, just share patients and do what's best for everybody. So I think um, having that relationship uh, between trial and implant and especially in private practice, finding a neurosurgeon or spine surgeon of some sort that you can collaborate with and, and form a good relationship with um, is, is really vital. And so I feel lucky that I, that I have that initially um, and it's been great. I, I love doing the trials and sending the perms to, to Steven. Great. Great, Tom. This one's for you, uh, Dr. McDowney. Uh, so we've seen a, a really big uh, explosion in minimally invasive spine now. Everything from minimally invasive lumbar decompression, interspinous spacers, interspinous fixation, fusion. Um, how do you see that fitting in in a practice when you have to work with surgeons? Uh, that's a great question. Um... By the way, my name is Janae McDami. I'm a fourth year resident at the Cleveland Clinic and I will be pursuing a pain fellowship next year at Rush. I also wanted to thank Dr. Deer and Dr. Syed for having me here tonight and you, Dr. Falowski, for moderating. So I think that's a great question. And I mean, it's gonna come down a little bit, you know, obviously the turf battles and discussing um, the overlap now between multiple specialties such as interventional radiology, spine surgery. So whether that's ortho or neuro and interventional pain physicians. Um, I think that as technology advances, we're going to um, be dealing with more and more of these issues with turf battles because there isn't a specific procedure or, or a specific treatment that only one particular physician can do. So I think it's all about communication and education and, you know, talking with your peers, whether they be surgeons or other colleagues, about what expertise that you do have and how they can benefit their patients. So let's say, for example, you're well trained at minimally invasive procedures and your surgeon has always been doing things a certain way, whether it's an open procedure or a more, more uh, not as minimally invasive. Um, I think it's important to be able to discuss that with your, you know, other providers and tell them, you know, how, you know, your technique may actually be beneficial for the patient. Um, and so we need to look at the patient and their outcomes over more so than, you know, are we giving away our specialty or are we, you know, um, losing business in terms of, you know, the patients that we're doing procedures on. So I think that it's very important that we just, you know, be open with each other and kind of um, do what's best for the patient. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, a lot of it, it falls on the spine surgeons to realize that uh, this is collaborative and they're actually not losing a large amount of their patients by uh, working with pain physicians uh, to do these procedures. So the last question is, uh, it's going to be towards uh, Nana, who I actually got to talk with and, and message with a little bit today. And we have the privilege of actually having someone from outside the U.S. Uh, on our panel who can give kind of a unique perspective. But I think the one question I can ask them is, you know, being outside the U.S., uh, I believe in France. Uh, so when do you actually decide to work with uh, a spine surgeon? Um, so, at first, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Nana Chanchalishul. I'm a fifth-year neurosurgery resident uh, from Georgia country, and I'm doing my master's degree in France uh, at University of Bordeaux. So, uh, currently, I live in Georgia, and uh, I, I want to say that this is kind of, we have kind of double barriers in my country. So, uh, the first and most important is that we're in a developing country, and, you know, this developing country, low-middle income country. and uh, the problem here is that we can't afford uh, the equipment required, and also we can't afford implants sometimes required for the surgeries. And the additional problem here is that for the country with population less than four million, we don't have uh, sometimes enough expertise in terms of surgery. And uh, I mean, we are we have kind of prioritized. Uh, the services which are more in a demand and we can't manage, uh, for example, diseases which are rare diseases and these patients have to travel abroad and uh, then sometimes it's more expensive than the actual 
um, cost of this equipment in our country. Thus, so this is the basic problem in my country as a developing country with population less than 4 million. But if you're asking generally about the countries outside US, my country cannot be a good representative for that. Uh, but uh, I, I can give another example. For example, uh, my country is post Soviet Union country, and uh, for other surrounding um, countries, neighboring countries, uh, for example, they don't even have public insurance, and we have some advantages compared to them in that point. But um, if we compare, for example, I had uh, training in United Kingdom in uh, Queen Square, which is the, the largest hospital. In, in, in neuro hospital in Europe. And uh, they have kind of different, um, I mean, absolutely high expertise and uh, uh, have highest quality services. But uh, there's, for example, long waiting periods and uh, different problems in uh, each country. Of course, I'm not comparing my country to UK, but you know, every country has their uh, own uh, disadvantages. As for in my case, uh, Country, for example, we have a case of complex regional pain syndrome, for example, and we were totally unable to manage these patients here. And even in my country, we cannot perform spinal cord stimulation uh, even for other back surgeries. And that's the main problem here because, I mean, no one has ever performed spinal cord stimulation in my country. And uh, these patients have to travel abroad, and this is sometimes even more expensive than the actual cost of this surgery in itself. And that's the main point. I mean, sometimes even if you would try to implant a service and start a new service here, patients do not have enough trust uh, because of the sometimes doctors do not have enough experience and patients even prefer to travel abroad. And that's kind of complicated stuff. And that's what I wanted to say. Well, thank you very much. It's, it's interesting to see that perspective and how it's very different than in the US. and. Having those challenges very, even with the modulation. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I just want to say thank you to all our panels. Thank you, Tim and Dawood, for putting this together. And I'll pass it back to you, Dawood. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. And special thanks to Nana from uh, probably, uh, it must be in the middle of the night there, I'm assuming. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And many thank you for this wonderful opportunity and for letting me participate. I really Absolutely. appreciate it. We look forward to you uh, doing the first spinal cord stimulator implant in the country of Georgia uh, in the future, for sure. Very exciting. I'm not sure to pronounce your name correctly, but uh, we do. I just want to remind you that we do have uh, I Aspen with Rita Tolba. I'd love to have you be a member, and we'll contact you about that. We need more leaders like yourself to improve our diversity in the international community for that. So uh, we'll be in touch uh, with you. So thank you for coming tonight. We greatly appreciate it. Um, thanks, man. Thanks. 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 Thanks to the rest of the rest of the panels as well. Excellent job. One. So we have uh, five minutes left. So uh, Jason Pope is going to join us and give his uh, top five points of the night. Uh, Jason, um, you know, uh, you heard a lot of discussions tonight. Uh, you you were a young uh, uh, leader about uh, I don't know a year or two ago when you were in your youth. Uh, <laughs> what's your top? Uh, give us your top few points of the night, and then uh, Dawa will tell you if you're correct or not. Well, I appreciate that. And I will say that if uh, we have to depend on the leaders that were represented uh, in this webinar, I would say our space is well cared for. So I really do appreciate all the uh, work and due diligence that every put in, everyone put in to pre uh, prepare for uh, all these panels. I think it was tremendous. Um, so I have a few minutes. I would just say that uh, largely when we think about where our space is, and I think the cost entry of uh, new therapies and new technologies in our space is really dependent on generation of data. And I think that was highlighted throughout a lot of the sessions. And not only the uh, generation of data, but its application. And as we're generating new information and we have these new therapies, it requires appropriate training. And I think that uh, Aspen has really taken the bull by the horns in providing opportunities for people to get trained in these innovative therapies. A lot of the posterior approaches for sacroiliac joint fusion, a lot of the minimally invasive spine therapies. Uh, what's really interesting to note is that we obviously didn't have that experience when I was in formal training. So I think this concept of continuing medical education is really critical. And I think uh, there's no better way and there's no better society to, I think, partner with than, uh, than Aspen. Um, 
I, I, I was prepared to ask some of the attendees throughout the event uh, some questions that were strategic, um, but I, I think the commentary on intrathecal therapy was really spot on. I thought that uh, you know we do have a lot of uh, evidence to generate regarding the use of intrathecal therapy for non-cancer related pain. I thought that the concepts uh, surrounding evidence generation for peripheral nerve stimulation and modification of some of the technologies that we have today and those that are coming on the market may uh, provide I think a better opportunity to care for patients in a longitudinal fashion. Uh, and then I think it's this concept of uh, translational comparative research surrounding using minimally invasive spine techniques or neuromodulation and comparing it to something else. You know, a lot of the studies that we have in our space compare one stimulation platform to another one there's very few uh, studies that have been performed in a randomized prospective way. Uh, we really look at comparative uh, treatment strategies to treat a single indication. I think this concept of real world data, uh, I think the concept of big data uh, is uh, the thing of the future. I do agree also with embracing telehealth and these technologies and I think really being forward facing for our patients. And, and I don't think that the introduction and the innovation that the 1135 waiver provided a lot of us as we are caring for patients is ever going to go away. So I think largely uh, we are, I think, well equipped in our space if you all are going to be leading it. And I appreciate uh, the time, attention, and direction that uh, Dr. Deer and Dr. Syed provided for our uh, conversation this evening. Dawa, do you have any follow-up questions for Jason? Well, I think that Dr. Pope is spot on in his assessment. You know, I really appreciate his comments. And uh, it's, you know, he's on the forefront of many of these initiatives in research and edu education. And we I, uh, look very much forward to him kind of leading Aspen to the next phase as the, the next president starting uh, in late July as well. So uh, we really look forward to his, his leadership continuing on within our society. I just want to say thank you to Jason, and I think Jason uh, joining the executive leadership team here very quickly is going to be wonderful for the society. Dawood remains as vice chairman of the, the society and will be there with us uh, to lead uh, things forward. Dawood, do you have a few announcements you'd like to make before we close, and uh, I'll give them over to you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we got a lot of, you know, as we come out of this pandemic, we have a lot of exciting upcoming programs uh, coming. We still, I think, have realized that the virtual world is something we'll continue to utilize. Uh, it'll probably be more of a hybrid model, but one of the um, big things uh, in this next year will be our international division, uh, IASPN. Uh, potentially, there will be a rebranding re to ISPN uh, in the future, but the first uh, webinar led by Rita Tolba, um, our good friend uh, who's uh, in uh, the UAE currently at the Cleveland Clinic Satellite Hospital there, will be re leading um, a regenerative medicine uh, topic-based um, session, which I think will be really exciting. We obviously um, invite everyone to join that, not just international members, but also all of our members uh, in the United States as well. Um, we also have a really cool uh, webinar coming up on machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence and integrative medicine and how that's going to kind of be the future of pain management as well. So look forward to having people join us for that on June 16th. It'll be a very unique uh, event. We have uh, another webinar coming up January 21st on imaging modalities, specifically MRIs, and how we should be utilizing those to make patient selection and therapy decisions. So I think that's going to be really innovative. We'll have radiologists and people from multiple specialties kind of weighing on that. So another unique CME event. Uh, we'll have our Young Innovators Lab. Uh, that's going to be January 8th in 2022. So that's going to be really uh, essentially one of the largest uh, labs that Dr. Pope and Dr. Falowski and a few others are going to be leading uh, in January 8th in Las Vegas. So uh, save the date for that for sure. And just let me add to that, we're going to have, so we're going to be covering all the minimally invasive uh, techniques. We're going to be covering regenerative medicine, neuromodulation. So it's not just a, a one area like neuromodulation, for example. We're going to cover regenerative medicine, uh, new minimally invasive spine techniques. Uh, Dawood, I think it'll be the most comprehensive lab ever held. Yeah, everything from peripheral nerve stimulation to minimally invasive fusion techniques to neuromodulation. So it's going to be essentially everything that's being done in our space and things that 
haven't really even been done yet and will be done in the future. So really, really exciting lab there. Uh, and then of course, our kind of uh, keystone event, which is our annual meeting. We'll have our third annual meeting. Everyone's really looking forward to that. First uh, in-person meeting for a lot of us, uh, July 22nd through the 25th at the Lowe's in Miami South Beach. So we really look forward to that. You know, we have, uh, I think we're closing in about a thousand people registered. So uh, space is filling up quickly. Um, so please register and, and join us in Miami. And then with that, I think, is that it? Okay, I think we're at the end of the deck. So, Tim, any closing talk, thoughts? You know, great job, every uh, young person who joined us tonight on the panels, those who watched tonight. I know people from all over the United States and other countries were watching, and, and I think that you should feel good tonight. We have great talent uh, here. I, I thought everyone on every panel did a great job. I was so impressed by the choices we made on who to put on these panels tonight, Dalwood, and it makes me feel good about the field. Uh, I think tomorrow you and I both could retire. Uh, and the field will go on. And that's a really great place for us to be. I feel really good about the field and I feel really grateful that I kind of got into the field about 10 years earlier because I don't think that I probably would have had the the board scores or the intelligence to even get into it at this point. It's uh, really intimidating at times to see, you know, the talent level that's coming into our field, but it's a really good thing for us as a specialty for sure. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone.